And now we're moving down, you know, further down to the local jurisdiction level to really talk about um, boots on the ground. We, I'll let everybody introduce themselves, but we've got uh, three local regulators and one state representative. And so our state representative can also talk to us about what they were thinking about at the state level for where were areas for local control and areas for the state. So, Dennis, why don't I have you get started? Sure. Could you introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and give us a little quick history about sort of where you guys are on, your, uh, on regulation. So, uh, my name's Dennis Bozanich. I'm the Deputy County Executive Officer for the County of Santa Barbara. And uh, I have been working in the cannabis regulation arena since uh, late 2015, and, and particularly in Santa Barbara since uh, this time in 2016, so three full years in Santa Barbara, where we pulled together a ad hoc committee of county staff, all of which touched in some ways uh, the cannabis industry when we realized we had a problem with odor control issues in the Carpinteria area, uh, which is abutted by a series of greenhouses that had converted from the cut flower industry uh, to cannabis. And so they had switched one flower from the other, but they smelt a little differently, at least according to the neighbors. And so we pulled together sheriff, district attorney, county council, uh, public health, uh, air pollution control district staff, uh, ag commissioner, uh, and planning and development as well, then with uh, myself facilitating a coordinated effort uh, at the county level to look at what was happening with uh, what were basically grandfather grow sites um, in 2016 and what were causing the odor problem. We then developed, a, a, from that, uh, we began to look at the fact that it was a problem that we needed to deal with it, and so we created uh, a complete land use permitting process, a complete cannabis business licensing process, and received voter approval for a cannabis tax measure with 76% of the vote for a 4% uh, gross receipts uh, tax on cultivation. We are primarily a, a, a uh, producer county. Um, we have uh, in the Santa Barbara County, you may not realize this about Santa Barbara, you just think nice beaches, um, but we're primarily an ag, ag county. And so we have 765,000 acres of ag zone property in our county, and only 4% of our county has urban development on it. So we have quite a large indigenous uh, ag uh, community. Today, um, we have the most state licenses, state provisional licenses of any county in the state of California. And I'll leave it at that. Great, Representative. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Illinois State Representative Sonia Harper. Um, I have been a member of the House since 2015. I currently serve as chairman or chairwoman of the Agriculture and Conservation Committee and also chairman of the Economic Opportunity and Equity Committee, which chairing both of those committees kind of made it ripe for, for me to be a kind of a spokesperson and a leader on uh, going legal in the state of Illinois. Uh, I am a former TV news producer, so I come from the journalism industry, but what also brings me to this subject matter um, is my work in growing and cultivating food uh, in the city of Chicago. So I've been very involved in urban agriculture, as in Chicago, uh, we have these things called food deserts. And so we were already looking at ways to use our land to grow, to grow food, grow our own medicine. And so it seems that uh, we were ripe and ready for the opportunity for legalization uh, to come to our community specifically. Um, so I represent a very diverse district in Chicago from the very affluent downtown um, all the way to the south side of the city where I lived. And we just passed our recreational bill this past May. Uh, we like to boast that it is at the moment, it is the most equity-centric legislation in the country, but now that means we have a lot of work to do to back up those claims uh, and implementation. Um, it was very important to our state to put social equity as the base of our bill. So before we made any decisions on the type of licensing and zoning or, or whatever, um, the first question we asked ourselves uh, was how can we make this the most equitable piece of legislation possible? So therefore, 
members of the Black and Latino Caucus were crucial to the drafting of our bill in Illinois and all of its components. Um, in fact, uh, also the engagement of those communities. Um, if it were not for the recommendations that were put down by the Black and Latino Caucus, we would not be going legal in Illinois. Um, there was a standoff saying that uh, if representatives and senators from those caucuses were not really brought in at the beginning of the process so that we could, again, make sure that we have everything that we need in this bill to not only bring revenue into the state that we need, but to also help those communities that have been harmed um, by the prohibition of, of marijuana. Um, and so everything worked out. We came together, we collaborated, and we finally passed a bill in May. No, it is not perfect. We'll probably be going back to the drawing board during veto session to do some cleanup. Um, but we do have a special rollout schedule for licensing um, that we hope will help to increase minority participation. We actually just released um, our first round of applications two days ago. Um, our first, we will not be doing any new cultivation. So we, are, we do already do medical in Illinois. We've been medical since 2015. There's currently zero minority participation in the market. And so again, we, we use that as a base to see how we were going to create craft um, the legalization. So we now have craft grow, transporter, and infuser uh, applications that have been released. And I'll talk a little bit more later on um, how we decide, um, again, in the most equitable way to um, approve those licenses. Um, I'm going to stop right there, um, but that's just a brief uh, introduction on me and where we are right now on legalization in the state of Illinois. Not there yet, but we are ramping up. Very good. Thank you. And Elise? Good afternoon. My name is Elise Lowe, and I am the director of the city's development services department. Um, city of San Diego is the second largest city in the state of California. We've got 1.3 million residents in a region of about 3.1 million. And we're also a uh, binational region with our proximity to the border. So um, uh, I really appreciated the comments from the former consul from Mexico and look forward to speaking with you more. Um, <clears throat> city of San Diego, um, may not quite have the robust approach that has been gone has gone forward um, in the state of Illinois in terms of equity, but uh, we are on our way to getting there. Um, we, uh, the state of California adopted the Compassionate and Medical Use in California in 96, and then uh, in 2003 for medical use. It wasn't until 2014 that the city of San Diego adopted our zoning regulations to allow for medical marijuana consumer cooperatives. And unlike um, the, the the speaker from Santa Barbara, we just utilized our existing discretionary entitlement land use process to create uh, conditional use permits for um, 36 total um, medical marijuana cooperatives and retail outlets, um, and then an additional uh, ministerial permit process for 40 production facilities. So um, we have a limit on the number that um, we allow, and that has made for a very, very interesting set of conversations as we go forward to try to serve the needs of the millions of people that I described that are in San Diego County. Um, with um, uh, our regulations, uh, they have been set by our city council to be incredibly difficult to achieve. Um, some of the most difficult zoning regulations, the highest paid land use attorneys all working on trying to find where the locations are that could possibly be to site a medical marijuana consumer cooperative or retail outlet. And um, what we call the permit Jenga that happens behind the scenes with um, all of the permits that get applied for and then appealed and withdrawn, um, I think in a three year period, our discretionary process, we normally hear about uh, in, on average uh, in one year, 200 um, discretionary um, permits for approval, and in a three-year period, we heard 153 all just on citing marijuana facilities. So um, it's been it's been quite an interesting process. Um, but the city uh, is 
working to build our um, cannabis bureau. Um, we had decided early on that we could take everything on in-house because um, of the our l large uh, permitting structure that we already had. We now realize that we need to create a more robust structure and um, we've been moving forward to um, create that with our economic development department, our city treasurer, fire and police, um, as well as the city's, um, my department's code enforcement working with my chief building official and then our, our building team. So um, San Diego is the first city of the um, 18 cities within San Diego County to adopt marijuana regulations. So we are very proud of that. Um, and there are a number of cities within our county that locally have elected not to do so. So there is even more dependence on San Diego's permitting structure. Um, but it, it's taken us uh, a couple of years to um, get to where we are within the process. A lot of lessons learned about how we do the uh, permitting and um, uh, and as much as I directed our staff to take that philosophical approach that um, you could treat it just like alcohol, um, we have way too many things within our specific ordinance um, for us to take that sort of hands-off approach. And we know that we need to create more um, ongoing compliance um, for uh, our regulatory monitoring um, so that we can really make sure that the community uh, gets what it desires in terms of protection and making sure that we have um, adequate resources for um, legal and illegal business operations and code enforcement. So with that, I will um, pass it on. Happy to answer more. And I'm Alex Friedman. For the last two years, I served as the general counsel to the Los Angeles Department of Cannabis Regulation, so working closely with uh, Kat Packer, uh, the executive director of Cannabis Regulation in LA. Uh, it just so happened, actually, on Monday, I've, I've left my government position to start my own consulting business, uh, working on cannabis matters, of course, but uh, I'm excited to sort of talk about the experience of the last two years in LA with you and uh, before 2018, the city of LA had a very large but very loosely regulated uh, cannabis market, medical marijuana market with dispensaries and, and uh, cultivation and the, the, full, the full gamut. And it had a very antagonistic relationship with that industry. After Prop 64 passed in 2016 though, the city of LA completely changed course and embraced the prospect of legalized and regulated cannabis. And at the end of 2017, our city council passed a 60-page ordinance that laid the groundwork for a market that would include at least 450 dispensaries, several hundred cultivators, an uncapped amount of delivery, manufacturing, distri distribution, and testing facilities. So uh, really set the stage for possibly probably between 1,000 and 2,000 licensed cannabis businesses in the city. They also uh, made social equity the key component of our licensing structure, where to the point that other than the grandfather dispensaries that got in first, the about 185 of them, all future dispensary licenses in the city of LA are going to social equity applicants, and there's also social equity applicant opportunities in the other areas. It has been a very, very complicated uh, trying process because the expectations in LA were raised so high, so many people want to get in, there's so many policy objectives that they baked into the system and they created such a complicated system. We're making progress and I think it just goes to show that there's no quick and easy way to do that. And I think the main way to, to approach it is to make sure you, you learn the lessons from the other jurisdictions to make it a little less painful and a little more productive um, and, and excited to talk about more of that today. Great. Great. So Elise used the um, term, uh, what did you say, permit junk Jenga, mm -hmm. the game, right? Um, does that resonate with uh, you, Dennis? I saw you nod your head, and can you expand on that? So um, I, I've long called uh, land use policies in Santa Barbara County uh, a blood sport. Um, for a variety of reasons, most of which involve the fact that real estate there is very expensive and we have um, a large cadre of um, not in my backyard types, uh, commonly known as NIMBY. So, um, you know, e everything is, is highly um, uh, contested um, and cannabis is no exception to that. And uh, we also are trying to make use of some older infrastructure 
um, many of which are dilapidated greenhouses from the cut flower industry that had um, really fallen in pretty serious disrepair and had also historically not had very good uh, building inspection and permitting histories. And so having to clean all of that up as part of the process of getting your cannabis permits has uh, created the Jenga game um, that Elise mentioned um, quite, um, quite significantly. We designed the land use permits, just real quickly, um, to be primarily ministerial, uh, only requiring a, a conditional use permit or a discretionary permit um, in only a few instances um, near um, some uh, existing rural residential neighborhoods and, and those kinds of circumstances. Uh, but we primarily had designed this as, as a ministerial over-the-counter process. It has turned out to be anything but that, and, and uh, it was a, a significant lesson learned for us in Santa Barbara. Yeah. And Alex, I think I heard you say part of your issue having a 40-page ordinance is some of what has, 60-page yeah. ordinance, <laughs> is some of what has slowed you all down. Is that accurate Yeah, and the way that it was written, yeah, exactly, it was, it was, it was not approached of how are we going to implement this, it was approached of how are we going to give everybody what they want. And so it was a political process that took place first. There was no regu regulatory body in LA before 2018. And so everyone was just like, you know, making it up essentially. And that's, that's inevitable in this position, but it was a very political process where we capped retail licenses and we capped cultivation. So everyone wanted to try to design the system to ensure that they got in before the door closed. And there was not a lot of thought about how is this going to be implemented. And it's really important to manage expectations. So as I was saying, we, in December 2017, we set a framework to ultimately license between 1,000 and 2,000 businesses. But the word coming from city council and, and other people in the government and outside is this can all be done in nine months. And they said that when the Department of Cannabis Regulation, which was going to be handed the responsibility to implement this, was just Cat Packer and two administrative clerks. And so people were living in a, in a fantasy land of, we will have 2,000 businesses, and three people will do it in nine months. And that kind of mindset really, people it added a lot of fat to our system mm -hmm. that we really don't need. And we've now dealt with that for the last two years of trying to get rid of it and figuring out how all this is supposed to work together. Because it wasn't designed necessarily to work together. It was designed to make sure people were satisfied with sort of their results. So, and um, Representative Harper, we talked about earlier, uh, Representative Singer from Colorado said something about um, that Colorado is really used to having local control, and the state really expected that the local jurisdictions would have local control, would figure out their local licensing schemes. Did you all have those types of conversations at the state level as you um, adopted your legislation? Yes, uh, definitely. In the state of Illinois, it was uh, one of our most important goals is to, to give local municipalities control, right? So municipalities may pass an ordinance um, to opt out, but they would have to pass the ordinance. And of course, they can act their own reasonable uh, restrictions uh, pertaining to zoning um, for those different types of uh, facilities, be they craft row, uh, processing centers, uh, and dispensaries. Well, and that final decision where a license is going to get issued is really fought on the ground. Um, Elise, can you tell us a little bit about some of the struggles that you guys have had with that licensing Jenga? Oh, I'd be glad to. There's so many good stories. We even talked about the possibility of making a, um, a lifetime television series about every all the <laughs> conspiracy theories. Um, uh, there was even a conspiracy theory at one point that um, when a young applicant um, uh, died uh, on the beach while jogging, that perhaps it wasn't just of natural causes. So that's how gross the conspiracy theories went. Um, but by making our conditional use permit um, process the licensing process, the discretionary process, um, that required every one of our applicants to um, uh, have, in, in California, we have the California Environmental Quality Act, known as CEQA. So um, you had to get a CEQA determination, and there was um, uh, a CEQA in itself is um, appealable to our city council, um, but the projects um, themselves were not. So we were seeing applicants um, uh, have their 
projects appealed um, both to our planning commission and then their environmental documents appealed uh, before the city council, but the appellants wouldn't actually show up to make the appeal arguments. They just wanted to stall someone in the amount of time that it was taking to get their permit because if the applicant who had made the appeal could move forward, then um, it was, you know, the two months that they bought and doing the appeal was worth it to them. And we actually even um, have changed our appeal process now. So we had to take a policy decision before the city council to say that um, if um, a, a project um, is appealed, um, it used to be that even if it was appealed and the appeal was withdrawn, that the city council still had to, uh, or that the legislative body still had to hear the appeal. So we've even had to make changes to our, our council's policy on whether or not we would hear an appeal if it was withdrawn um, to try to save some of the time. Our, our biggest issue was really how do we be as um, equitable and as fair in the overall process, in this competitive process nature. Um, some of the other items that uh, have happened as um, our permitting process evolved was that we realized that our land use and the zoning and the requirements for the thousand foot um, setback from sensitive receptors and minor oriented facilities was so restrictive um, that we couldn't actually get the number of facilities that we needed. We've allowed 36, um, and I think that we have now permitted 23 with nine pending, but the distance requirements, it was a thousand feet by the way the crow flies, we've actually now changed that, where we are in the process of changing that to the path of travel from walking from one place to another um, so that we could get towards meeting that, um, the desired number of um, retail licenses. So um, it's it's been quite, it's been quite a game. And, and the last thing I do wanna say about um, our CEQA and how contention and everything that has been that recently the Supreme Court handed, handed down a decision that um, the environmental determination that the city made for um, allowing essentially exemptions for the medical marijuana cooperatives that we permitted in 2015, it has now overturned that and said that that determination was inadequate. And now we have to go back for everyone that was permitted in 2015 and ones that have not moved forward. We have since removed medical marijuana cooperatives and made a medical, or I'm sorry, made a marijuana outlet usage, which you can sell um, medicinal as well as recreational, uh, but that required an additional conditional use permit. So those folks that have been operating under the medical marijuana community cooperative um, will lose their ability to operate now that the Supreme Court has overturned that environmental determination as well. So a lot, lot to keep track of, a lot going on. Yeah. And also, I think, um, you know, we've talked a lot at this this year's symposium about uh, race and social equity. And as I understand, you know, California does not have that baked into their initial legalization like Illinois has our, has just done. But, um, and Elise and Dennis, you all do not currently have an equity program and licensing. Is that accurate? That's right, there's desire by um, several of our council members to put that forward. Uh, uh, the mayor would like to see the development of our actual cannabis licensing bureau as a precursor to the development of that program so that we can ensure um, its viability. Okay. Yeah, and we, we don't either in Santa Barbara County. Uh, again, I, I think um, most of what we've seen around the social equity work has been in particularly looking at the retail side um, given given its um, uh, profitability, um, but but we um, are beginning to have those conversations. We are going to allow a limited number eight um, in the unincorporated area, eight cannabis retailers in the unincorporated area, and there is a discussion that I'm facilitating on October 15th with our board of supervisors to talk through how that social equity component would be a part of that. Yeah. So, uh, talking with local jurisdictions, we've talked about licensing. I want to move on a little bit to regulation and enforcement so we can have time for questions. But does anybody else have anything, they, any other thing they would like to add to give advice to any of these jurisdictions around, uh, out here about licensing or any other comments on licensing before we pivot? To, to link it up with social equity, since it is so tied in with licensing in, in LA and in main jurisdictions to come, is that it's important to keep in mind that Passing a social equity program does not create a social equity program. And so the, when you pass a social equity program, it comes with a lot of promises and expectations, but there's a lot of work left to be done. And what we ran into in LA is our council passed a, an, an ordinance that established the social equity program and gave the city the, 
legal authorization to implement it, but they didn't provide DCR and, and CAT any funding for the program for 18 months afterwards. So they passed the program in December 2017. Funding wasn't available to support applicants, hire vendors, and contractors until January 1st, 20, uh, July 1st, 2019. And that has really set back the city of, of not being able to provide support to applicants who, who need it, who are, who are promised it. So if, you're, if social equity is going to be a component of your uh, legalization, your licensing system, you have to lay the, set the plan for how do you actually implement it and fund it, because that's what a program is ultimately. It's not just a, an ordinance. Right, right. And Representative Harper, I know you did so much work in this area. Can you tell me a little bit about your conversations at the state level about those pieces, whether it's um, funding or resources, and, and how you would navigate that with your local jurisdictions? So yeah, just as he said, it's not enough that you pass it or put it in law. You actually have to fund it, and that was one of our, our biggest things from the, from the beginning. Um, and so we did create a $20 million low-interest loan program that will be administered by our Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. And so they will give grants to, um, sorry, loans to the social equity applicants. And so along with that, we created the new licensing, uh, we, we created the social equity program. Uh, way that you can apply for a license as well. The other part of that is that we are not just letting everyone get a license or apply for everything at once, we're releasing them in waves. And the reason that we're doing that is because, yes, we would love for there to be new cultivators on, on January 1st, uh, but we can't do that if we want to make sure that minority businesses get a chance to enter the market. So what we're going to do is we're going to release a wave of applications first. We're going to wait, do a disparity study for a year. And then according to the results of that disparity study, we will be able to go back and make whatever changes to the application process, the scoring, so that when we do actually release the application for cultivation licenses, uh, perhaps our minority businesses um, will be at a little bit more of an advantage and we can uh, legally be able to grant them applications more so uh, than anyone else. And so we have received a lot of criticism for that just because on day one there will be still no minority participation and everyone still has to to buy their products um, from the current uh, cultivators in the city. However, I mean, in the, in the state. Um, however, that's something that we're working through. Um, along with funding, I believe that outreach and education is also an important, mm -hmm. uh, an important deal um, that we can't forget that as well, right? So it's enough to put the programs there. It's enough to put something up. But are we really reaching out um, to the communities that really need to receive this information in, 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 the, most, uh, in the best way? Um, we could say that about a lot of the initiatives that we already have um, in the state level or on city levels, not just uh, cannabis. And so the outreach, the education, of course, the proper funding, um, I think all go along with coming up with whatever those uh, special so social equity mm -hmm. programs are. Well, and it'll be really great to see how that plays out. I think um, your local leaders who are in these local positions that we are in trying to implement these programs, having that leadership from the state is really going to help set them up for success. As you said, it might slow them down a bit, but we sort of know what's going to happen if you just open it wide open and let people apply. Right. We know what's going to happen. That's right. So I want to pivot to um, enforcement. Um, talk to you all a little bit about what challenges you've seen with enforcement. Um, maybe talk to us about your your philosophy on enforcement. Um, I think it was it was um, it was Alex. Um, wait, I wrote her name down. It was Lori Ajax who talked about you know when a lot of us first started, we had the Cole Memorandum hanging over our head, and so we were saying, okay, strict rules and robust enforcement. If we have strict rules and robust enforcement, um, the federal government will not shut us down. And so a lot of us built these pretty heavy regulatory frameworks, and we also enforced. Um, so kind of want to know if anybody, if, if that's where you are, if you've been pivoting. Um, Dennis, if you'd like to start. Maybe just to start, I, I, I think we very much um, gave birth to the cannabis uh, licensing and permitting program in Santa Barbara County um, in the midst of the Cole Memo, um, the dynamics going on in California with draft regulations, interim drafts, draft of drafts, um, and trying to like hit this moving target with something that we needed to get through our board. Um, through uh, what is now 55 public meetings um, with full active public participation. There isn't a cannabis hearing we do in Santa Barbara County that lasts less than three hours. 
um, of Board of Supervisors time. But we, we were really, um, this, this issue of, of compliance, which we, in our glossary of terms, compliance is what we do with the licensed market and enforcement is what we do with the unlicensed market. Um, and one of the philosophy shifts that we've begun to make on this compliance thing, because we did create this robust regulatory structure uh, in keeping with the times. But we're trying to philosophically move that from just being reliant on compliance with the rules and regulations to how do we have a co-commitment with one another to carrying out the regulations that they have. Because they were part of the process. The industry was part of the process in developing the regulations. This is what they said that they wanted and needed. Um, we helped do that, informed with a programmatic environmental impact report that we did um, prior to uh, creating our ordinances in Santa Barbara County. Um, but we're, we're now working really hard to say, let's do this together so that I don't have to be running around and playing whack-a-mole and chasing people people that are our licensees um, to make sure that they're performing correctly. So um, I read a pretty influential book from Harvard Business uh, uh, Publishers a few years ago that talks about this issue of how do you move people from just simply being compliant to being committed to the same goals. And so that's really where we are with our industry at this point. But I think the real measure of our success in Santa Barbara has been on, on the enforcement side. Um, one of the goals of the Board of Supervisors in adopting the regulations and, and by promoting and uh, having voter approval of the tax measure was to create revenue that we never had before in order to go and do enforcement on the illegal market. And that was a high priority for the Board of Supervisors and a high priority for the public and, as you can imagine, a high priority for the licensed industry. So in the first four quarters of the cannabis tax, Santa Barbara County collected $6.9 million. In that time, we spent $2 million, the first $2 million we spent on enforcement. And we have six deputy sheriff that work on our enforcement team, a dedicated uh, deputy district attorney, a DA investigator, an investigator from, two investigators actually from our agricultural commissioner's department, one on the weights and measure side, the other one on the pesticide enforcement side, our planning and building officials, uh, our office, our county council. We meet every other week for an hour and we case manage every single enforcement case as a group. And up to now, we've cut down 1.4 million illegally grown plants in Santa Barbara County. Wow. We've confiscated 43 tons of processed marijuana products from illegal grow operations. And I challenge anybody, and, and one of my things I was gonna say at the end, and I'll wrap up here, you're only as good as the other organizations, the other jurisdictions next to you in terms of enforcing these regulations. And regional approaches, I, I, I think we would all highly recommend. But one of the things that is um, really pretty devastating for us right now in California is that three quarters of the jurisdictions in the state of California have opted out of the legal supply chain. And what that does is basically allows the illegal market to be the de facto market in three quarters of the state of California. And if I've got people that are willing to cheat and lie and grow cannabis illegally to supply all those places that won't allow it, that's a problem for me. And I'm spending $2 million a year, actually, our taxpayers are spending $2 million a year, as authorized by the board, to go after the black market because a whole bunch of the state won't make it legal. There's something wrong with that. So Alex, I've heard um, both you and Kat speak a little bit about um, some of the struggles you've had with the black market. Have you had the, the same luxury that Dennis has had to really have that high level of focus on the black market? You know, it's, it's been a challenge with, in LA since the beginning of legalization of, of how do we put an end to the illicit market. We've, when we started this, we probably had two or three times the number of illegal dispensaries or unlicensed dispensaries as licensed ones. And for the first year, it was there was sort of a lack of centralized leadership at the highest levels of the city government to really make sure that all the departments were staying on the same page and working towards the same goal. We would have meetings where the mayor shows up and all the department heads are there and it's, everyone's on the same page and then they all leave and then it's a meeting six weeks later and nobody's done anything and then it just sort of tapers off 
And for that was sort of the first year of 2018. Uh, once 2019 rolled around, they really realized how much this was affecting the tax revenues we were bringing in because we were losing tax revenues because no one was shopping at the licensed stores. They were all going to the unlicensed stores. Uh, we've, we've refocused our efforts, and there has been a lot more top-down leadership in the task force model and using additional tools. We started shutting off the power of unlicensed dispensaries. Now, of course, they just get a, a generator within a day or two, but it's just one of the first sort of steps to make it more difficult. We're moving towards a what we call a padlock ordinance, where we'll be padlocking or barricading these illegal dis uh, dispensaries. And the strategy is expanding to looking towards, well, there's just some people who are going to do it because they can make money. And if it's only a misdemeanor, it's a slap on the wrist. In LA County, you get summary probation. You don't go to jail. So. They're redirecting their efforts towards the property owners who are allowing these businesses places to operate and trying to make it uh, apparent that there will be consequences to the property owners where we can actually take away your property if you let this to continue to go on. We'll see how effective that is. We're hoping that the padlock ordinance, which will come into place hopefully by the end of the year, is that kind of final you know, straw that the property owners will say, okay, it's not worth it anymore. Um, I think there's also the biggest failing of the local jurisdiction and the state is just the public education. A lot of customers, even if they want to shop at a licensed store, wouldn't know how to find one or tell an unlicensed store from a licensed store. Right. We have listings on our website, but they're just, it, it, the message doesn't get across just what exactly you're doing when you're shopping at a licensed store versus an unlicensed store. What the testing is, what you're supporting. And I think the the local and state government, but industry as well, need to play a bigger role in the public education. It's not going to solve the problem, but I think there's a lot of consumers, if they understood what they were doing, would say, you know what, I want to shop at a licensed store. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, and it's kind of interesting how, how Dennis talked about, well, with their licensed businesses, you call that compliance, and with the illegals, you call it enforcement. But if you have a business that's licensed but skirting the rules, then they are illegal. And so you sort of walk this balance um, that then you put in these strict rules and robust enforcement that then impacts Representative Harper's social equity program because there's barriers to entry to comply. Um, so I think, Elise, I'd like to hear from you. How do you strike that balance between what is compliant, what is black market, is there such a thing as a gray market? Because I hear some people say there's no such thing as a gray market. It's either legal or not legal. Um, well, I do think that there is a gray market because I do think that we have licensed operators who are not fully compliant, but we haven't shut them down. Uh -huh. So if they're still selling and we're still getting some of their tax revenue, but in some cases um, we are not getting uh, fully audited statements, uh, we haven't shut them down yet because I only have one zoning inspector right now doing compliance for our permitted. So we work with the San Diego Police Department for the crackdown on the illegal pot shops. Um, we also have major problems with distribution. Um, we, we, our distribution, it, it's out of control. We don't have, um, uh, we have, we allow um, distribution from licensed facilities to other licensed facilities. But if you open any rag magazine, every ad in San Diego is about delivery just to your home. And um, we have a lot more to do with cracking down on that level of enforcement. And that will absolutely take um, a regional approach. So um, um, I, I really think that, th that there is a gray area. Um, and you know, with our license operators, um, I, again, I was talking about how contentious the process is. Um, I was going to mention as part of the Days of Our Lives episode that we're going to put on um, that the conditional use permit that you get to operate your facility, um, it goes with the property not with the person. That entitlement is a land use entitlement. So there are landlords who made lease agreements with um, operators for these retail outlets having no idea the amount of cash that was going to come through the door. And once they figure that out, they are actually refusing to sign on the dotted line for the permit before the permit can go be recorded because they are now trying to extort from 
the retail outlet owner, uh, who knows how many times the amount of rent that was. So now of the permittees that we have, we actually can't get all of the per permittees up and operating because in some cases, not only are they in disagreement with their landowner about what the, the rent and the leasing rates should be, they're now in court with one another. And that is ongoing for, for years. And so um, I really do believe that there is a gray area because I believe that those operators are probably <laughs> operating somewhere else right now in order to continue to make the revenue that they need in order to support those those court cases. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many complexities at this state, at the local jurisdiction level. So Representative Harper, can you tell us a little bit about some of the conversations you had around how do you keep, how do you have a, a regulated industry and does it need to be highly regulated? And when it's highly regulated, you know, we are inadvertently or, or intentionally create, creating barriers to entry. Sure. So I can talk a little bit um, about you know how we've tried to address that in our statute and the way that we've set up um, our departments and just the flow of the program. And that's from the governor um, has actually just appointed uh, our new cannabis czar, right? And our cannabis czar basically is in charge of coordinating everything that has to deal with implementing the recreational program and making consistently making rec recommendations um, for legislation or rulemaking, um, but also just making making sure the bill does what we want it to do and keeping an eye on all of our social equity components. So I am uh, very much looking forward to seeing how, how her name is Senator Toy Hutchinson, who she was very uh, instrumental in drafting the bill, um, is going to help us to keep all of those different moving parts, right? Um, legalization basically touches about eight different departments in the state. And then, you know, of course, it goes down to uh, the municipal level. However, our Department of Financial and Professional Regulation and our Department Department of Agriculture really have the most of the burden, right? One of them um, is, is in charge of the licensing for dispensaries, and the Department of Agriculture is in, is in charge of all of the growing and the cultivation centers. And so um, we just want to make sure, uh, th again, that on every level we're able to coordinate so that we can have the desired results. Um, when it relates to um, law enforcement, um, of course, that's not, that's not something that we were able to make immediate decisions on, except for to allocate 8% of our revenue mm -hmm. to law enforcement so that we can continue to you know, figure out ways uh, that we need to be on top of the industry. But we have really left it up to the municipalities um, to, 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 to figure out an immediate policy. Right now, this is an issue on whether there should be any enforcement of simple possession now until January 1st, right? right. What do we do about that? Technically, any possession of cannabis remains legal until then, at, wh at which point, after January 1st, um, any possession over 30 grams is still illegal. Um, so still have a lot of more questions to answer there. And um, some of those questions will be, like, will local law enforcement continue to arrest people, right? Um, and, and should they continue to arrest for any amounts uh, under 30 grams? Actually, one of our state's attorneys has refused to uh, prosecute, yeah. prosecute any more cases mm -hmm. going forward, but that's just one county, right? And what is happening in all of the other counties? And so I'm hoping um, that our cannabis czar and, and, and the implementation and the coordination of all of our agencies will help us to continue to answer some of those questions as we still look to, you know, other states to see how they're dealing with it as well and take best practices from them. Yeah, well, and I think the funding piece at you all that is just inherent in your legalization is really key. So we've been talking for about an hour. I'd like to turn it over to some questions. But before I do that, does anyone have anything sort of top of mind they'd like to add to the conversation? Elise? I just want to um, say thank you to everyone that's here. Some of the um, takeaways from this panel and our pre-call, as well as even today, about um, how San Diego um, should move forward uh, with its social equity program have been very, very helpful. And I just want to say that um, as we continue to work on our program, it's just been immensely helpful. So thank you to everyone for participating and bringing a lot back to what we're doing. Appreciate it. Great. Great. All righty, um, so we are ready for questions. Looks like we have someone in the back. Hi, I'm Jamie and I'm from California. Um, my question is um, on the county level, how did your board of supervisors, um, let's see, how can I frame this question? So um, the complexity that you talk about in creating these ordinances, right, kind of get complicated 
uh, with Board of Supervisors input, okay. right? Trying to be helpful. But how much of it was influenced by people in the industry, like for example, contributing to their campaigns? Did you have any of that experience in your respective counties? Have you read any newspaper stories about Santa Barbara County, perhaps? No, but I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> Anybody I, else read any stories about an, Santa Barbara County? That's an important um, component uh, it is. to the complexity. Yeah. So I'll, I'll real briefly outline kind of how we got started. So on February 14th of 2017, I brought an item. This was in the immediate aftermath of Prop 64 passing in the state of California. Um, it was also after I had begun that interagency uh, discussion within our staff about what was happening at Carpinteria with the odor-related issues. And so I brought an item to the board basically saying, hey, look, it's a, it's a new world. Um, Prop 64 has passed. We've got this um, legacy medical cultivation pro process that, you know, frankly, isn't working uh, very well. Uh, what do we, and, and we've got this new licensing program that's um, ready to start on January 1st, 2018. Uh, what do you want to do? And at that board meeting on February 14, 2017, it's Valentine's Day, I'll never forget it, um, they said, uh, we'd like to appoint two members of the board as an ad hoc subcommittee to work with county staff to come up with the basic structure of what that would look like, and then, then, then we'll turn it over to the regular ordinance development process um, once we kind of give some general direction, but as a way to accelerate that initial process to get some guidance from the board. There were two members of the board that were appointed to that sub ad hoc subcommittee, um, and it, we never had industry in that ad hoc subcommittee meeting whatsoever, um, but they were buzzing around the room, uh, you know, euphemistically. Um, and, and so they, they were, um, but you know, as we talked about this morning in almost every session, um, the industry provides a key role for those of us who, who are basically uh, cannabis bambies, <laughs> right? And I mean, I, I, I'm a city kid. I grew up in San Pedro in LA. I mean, I, I didn't know agriculture, especially commercial level agriculture from a hole in the ground. Um, and so I needed to kind of go and learn. And I, and I, I mean, I, my experience with cannabis was at a different point in my life, not as a grandfather. Um, and so I, I think, you know, we all had to learn and the industry was the best teacher for us. Um, so we learned a lot. Did they influence process? Yes. Um, did they get everything they want? Hell no. Did they contribute money to political campaigns? Heck yeah, that's the process. That's what happens. That's what, that's why we, you know, we all put on our big boy pants and our big girl pants and we know that there's elected officials that do that and then there's those of us who at staff who provide objective analysis and provide them our best advice. And that's how we worked it out in, city, in, in the county of Santa Barbara. Not always fun, not always pretty and it does look a lot like sausage making. Elliot, looks like there's a question down up front. And I think we've all experienced that, and it's regardless of the industry too, right? And, and we've we've gone back twice for major amendments, you know, to the ordinance. I mean, we're continuing to refine it. We just implemented another set of amendments last week. I'm bringing on October 15th some changes to the retail ordinance uh, portion of the ordinance. So it's a work in progress. So. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Yadira Silva. I represent Cerda Imports. And as a member of the Black and Brown Committee Equity. I would like to request a program where Latinos and other people from other countries would not lose their USA naturalization from being in the cannabis industry. Because I've been told that I cannot apply for any of these licenses due to the, to the fact that I can lose my naturalization. So, yeah, we, we, so I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We've had many people approach in, 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 in LA Department of Campus Regulation who have had that issue, and it's unfortunately it's a federal uh, rule, you know. And, and we've had people who have to tell them, look, you need to, uh, if you if you have if your immigration status is something you have to be concerned about, you have to consider how applying for a license to violate federal law um, is going to impact it, and it's a very serious uh, thing. And and um, unfortunately, the, the cities and states. Uh, we, we can't impact that other than uh, until that changes at the federal level. Well, so right now this, the city, at least the city of LA, does not discriminate based upon your, your immigration status. So we will, we don't ask for your immigration status. We will give you a license regardless. 
But because it, it impacts whether you can could possibly stay in this country because of federal law, um, it's a very, very challenges decision for applicants to make, but so while we allow anybody to apply, we can't change the fact that your application may have impacts as far as the federal government sees it. And for the federal government to change that, that could take away that concern, but the states and the cities don't get to change that federal rule. I think, uh, yeah. I think we may need to move on from this question. If uh, you would like to connect with any of these speakers yeah. offline, I think they'd be happy to speak with you. Thanks, Elliot. Hi, Mark, fr Mark from Southern California. Uh, do any of your jurisdictions have a form of uh, social consumption permitting, or in, is it in their, your ordinance in any manner? Uh, we're faced with that now that we're starting to uh, allow cultivation and manufacturing. So the city of LA is about to start the policy process for that of, of setting the, the land use restrictions and then the operational and, and uh, uh, licensing requirements for it. Our, our neighboring city, West Hollywood, just uh, has, has, has dived into it like kind of no other jurisdiction other than San Francisco uh, in the state. Um, and they just opened the local cafe. It's been getting a lot of press. And it, a lot of our operators see that as a very important part of their business model, especially the brick and mortar retailers of their freight delivery is going to take a lot of their market and that they need to turn these locations into a, a social setting that can draw people in. It's, I think, going to be a very difficult political process because it, it brings a lot more of the concerns for communities that are around these areas and how do you have responsible vendor policies to make sure people are not leaving and getting in their cars? How do you ensure that there's the public health aspect of people in these consumption spaces are not being exposed to, you know, uh, dangerous levels of smoke. Uh, there's all sorts of questions, though I think it's very important for jurisdictions to ultimately look forward towards that. Uh, it's going to think it'd be a trial and error, though, for the next few years of finding a model that works, that's economically viable, and that addresses the public health and community concerns. Um, yes, what he said. <laughs> yeah. um, and I was going to say in Denver, a couple of years ago, our voters passed something. It was Initiative 300 to allow designated consumption areas in Denver. Um, the state had not already passed something similar to that. So we have a lot of information on that if you'd like to um, connect with us. And we have a lot of stuff on, on our website about and, the things that we looked at. Just to plug, about. Eugene Hillsman, he's the oh. one of the key uh, regulators in the okay. city of San Francisco, and they've been regulating the consumption spaces for about a year now. Mm -hmm. So if you have a question, San Francisco is a great resource for that. Their public health department put out some great regulations. Mm -hmm. So it's a great, uh, great template to work off of. Perfect, perfect. Yes. Okay, good afternoon. Um, Pak Yvonne, Kauai Fire Department. Um, with the food truck craze, have you folks had any policy regarding mobile extraction facilities? Hmm. We thought we've seen everything, but yeah. um, no, I don't think I mean, we've seen that in Denver no. yet. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we, so we've seen mobile testing facilities. That's a kind of a, a, a regular uh, thing for QA testing for growers in Santa Barbara area. So they do have mobile testing. Uh, we have not seen, and, and our ordinance would not allow because you would have to have a land use permit, um, which would um, kind of mean you would have to take the wheels off the food cart. <laughs> Yeah, we, we haven't seen that either. And just generally with manufacturing, we haven't even in LA allowed any volatile manufacturing. It's That just is going to take a lot of time and people to feel the comfort level of, uh, of what to allow. Uh, we haven't seen anything like that yet, and our ordinance would not allow it. Um, we have seen just randomly a lot of um, pop-up markets um, for the sale of cannabis and, and, and marijuana, and um, those are not currently allowed, uh, but we're trying to figure out how to regulate those as well. You know, I do want to make a pitch censure in, in the fire service. Um, you know, fire regulations are pretty robust tools to help manage public health and safety. And so I just want to, for anybody looking at, at uh, this, making sure that that integration with your fire uh, codes is, is something that uh, we regularly utilize in, in our compliance and enforcement work. Yeah. So, so, plug for you guys. Gals, women. So, anything else, Elliot? Right here. All righty.
Hello, uh, Craig Small from Open Law Group. Um, at, from an attorney's point of view, not a, a jurisdictional point of view, we find that open communication helps with alleviating a lot of these problems. So the question I have for the panel is, as you develop these budgets, as you develop your regulations, are you creating positions just for liaisons to be able to pick up the phone, answer emails, and help us through the process so that we can effectuate your agenda and our clients' agendas? Thank you. For LA, because of the size of the market and the amount of the interest, that's been one of the biggest challenges for the Department of Cannabis Regulation there of, of just the, I mean, on a monthly basis, we probably get from in-person visits, phone calls, emails, well over a thousand inquiries. And, and they're unique, generally. I mean, like, there's, there's some overlap, but people have a broad range of questions. And it's just a, I, we, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, part of it is like, you know, if you're, you know, in the industry, or you, it's, it's pr provide useful information to your regulators, knowing that they're searching for answers, they're dealing with things for the first times, just like everybody else. And having good ideas come to them is, it's many cases, is welcome. Um, but a lot of it's just kind of, trying to deal with the massive inflow of questions and, and being as transparent and, and, and putting that information online so there's nobody has sort of a inside track. It, it, but it's, it's it, it, depending on the jurisdiction of how big it is, the interest is so immense that there's, you're, there's always going to be shortcomings in how you'd want to be able to respond to everybody. I'd say for the city of San Diego, um, that's uh, technically um, a service that we provide now. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out to my team over there. Raise your hands, ladies, because they are the Cannabis Bureau, and they are answering upwards of um, 20 emails a day, as well as 25 phone calls a day, um, answering all of those questions about how to get through our process, um, about how to do the appeals, about um, talking to the state, about what we've talked to the state about, um, about what policies are coming forward, et cetera, et cetera. So we are are providing um, that technical assistance now. Uh, I do only see it uh, needing to become more robust. Um, because our land use uh, entitlement permitting process is so complicated that essentially people hire people that they pay $400 an hour to advise them about how to get through that process, there's no way that a social equity applicant would be able to afford that starting off. So that does need to be, if we're going to keep the system um, a discretionary condition use permit process, that would be something that I would recommend that we build into our bureau. But um, I do um, think that that's one thing that San Diego um, has been able to provide robust technical assistance to our applicants. So we'll continue that um, as a level of customer service. We want to be Amazon level customer service. We, we, um, we, do, uh, we have a pretty robust website that has FAQs and tons of stuff, but we do twice a year an industry meeting. Uh, where we bring everybody together, including all their land use uh, attorneys and, and, and permit processors, their accountants, their lawyers, whoever wants to show up. It's, it's a big, fun, fun afternoon. <laughs> um, uh, but we bring them together on a regular basis. But I, I do want to make a, a real pitch for all of us in this is there's a lot of public education that needs to go on, let's say, with the media, for example. Um, that is really significant work that then allows that message to echo out. Um, in, in ways that are really, really important. And so we've, um, fortunately or unfortunately, never said no to a, you know, a, a desire for an interview from any of the national media, from any of the local media. We bring people on cannabis tours all the time to show them what's happening in the industry, to try to dismi dismi um, dismiss the, the uh, assumptions or the fears um, as much as, as possible. Uh, and the industry has now taken that on themselves as their own mission um, because they now realize it's not up to us as local government to do that, um, but they really have the ones that we've given a pathway for them to be uh, legal and be in compliance. And so now they need to take on that responsibility with their friends and with their neighbors to do that public education. And we, we're very much encouraging of that. Well, and I think that question raises, once again, some of the barriers to entry. And so, Representative Harper, can you tell us about some of the conversations you all might have had along those lines with technical assistance or support services or consultants and attorneys? Sure. And again, that's that's one of the biggest reasons why, why we have the Cannabis yeah. Czar, right? Um, because we needed a place where, where all of those questions could be answered. and. Um, 
Also, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity um, is a big help in that area. They're going to be helping people um, navigate the process to apply for those low interest mm -hmm. loans, right, that, that also go with the program. So I also think that it is um, also up to the individual senators and representatives to continue to educate, you know, their own constituencies. I think, to be honest, uh, it, I have no problem getting people to come to a town hall meeting about cannabis. Now, if I have right. one about gun violence or I have one about education, I got to go beg the people right. to come out. But I have a town hall meeting about yeah. cannabis. Everybody and their mama shows up. But uh, um, that's right. I get them in there, and then I and then I tell them about something else I need them to get on board with. <laughs> but um, yes, people people want to be engaged and they, and they want to feel a connection. And we do need to make it easier um, for folks to be able to connect to us. So I think that on a state level. Our cannabis czar office um, should be in very big communication with the local municipalities. In Chicago, we don't even have an ordinance yet, um, so I can't speak to what that may look like, but I would hope they would also have something similar um, and a very robust um, public education and outreach program to help people navigate the, the application process. We realize that that is one of the, the, the biggest setbacks, not just in, in, in trying to create a cannabis business, but in any business, right? And so we want that to be around all the time, again, not just in this industry, but in all industries. Great, thank you. And is Elliot, you're doing okay? Do we have any more questions? All righty, well I think then we, we finished about 10 minutes early. Um, give us a little bit of a break, thank you. Can I have a round of applause for our awesome panel? Um, I think we learned a lot today, so thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone.